Kaczynski, Spiros Nodiades, A.T. Robertson, Joseph Thayer, Kenneth Wiest, each of these linguists translates the masculine singular heist as one person, and it's the same lexicons that my opponent uses in his book. Jesus is, ladies and gentlemen, the one Old Testament God manifest in the flesh to us for the sake of the redemption of mankind. He is not a second of three divine individuals in a trinity that absolutely no one knew existed for 4,000 years. This is not misusing and abusing lexicons. I'll say it again. But again, I will demonstrate tonight before it's over my opponent's mis- use. The lexicons give the literal definition, and from there they begin their commentary, and they begin their interpretation. I know that. But a literal definition is not commentary. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says this, in Christ dwells all the fullness, pasho pleroma, of the Godhead in bodily form. The Greek word for all, lexicographers define as the whole, everything. The Greek word for fullness is pleroma. Bowers, page 672, defines pleroma like this, the full measure of deity. See Colossians 2 and 9. If I'm accused of misusing it and taking it out of context, they say this in, in Bowers' lexicon. Vines, page 137, defines this word as God in the completeness of his being. The whole completeness or full measure of God's being dwells in Christ. Who, allowing the text just to speak for itself, would read Colossians 2 and 9, where it says, For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and conclude that Jesus is the second divine individual in in the Trinity. It is a grossly unnatural, forced interpolation into the Word of God. I have another page here, but my time is up. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. A spirited reply and indeed thrown down the challenge to our affirmative status quo. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now entering uh, the next phase of the debate and this is a series of rebuttals. Now, a rebuttal section is where each speaker gets to attack the main arguments of their opponent. They need to attack it substantively and then link it back into their own argument to once again demonstrate the strength of their own case. No new material or brand new arguments can be introduced at this stage. New examples can be introduced, but no brand new arguments. Each speaker will have 15 minutes in their first rebuttal round, and after this first round we will have a short break, and then we'll have a second rebuttal round after that. So I'd like to invite our affirmative speaker, Dr James White, for his first rebuttal. Let's make him welcome. Well, thank you very much. I hope you are listening very closely so that we can get right to the important material here. Mr. Perkins has said that we have entirely different hermeneutical approaches. Yes, I would suggest to you that when you do what Mr. Perkins says we should do, and limit God's revelation of himself only to what you have in the Old Testament, or at least how Mr. Perkins understands the Old Testament, then why did Jesus come? Because when you think about it, what happened in the coming of Jesus Christ? Are we seriously to say that, well, you're limited in your understanding of God to what you can derive from the Old Testament, and there could be nothing more? Apply that to the book of Hebrews. Think what would happen to the book of Hebrews if the Jews took the position Mr. Perkins does. Because everything the book of Hebrews says, those were types and shadows. There's a greater fulfillment. There's something much more. Oh, no, 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 no. You've got the wrong hermeneutical approach. If you, do, if you do that, then you have to dismiss the entirety of the apologetic portion of the book of Hebrews, which is all the book of Hebrews is about. We accept everything the Old Testament says. We start with the Old Testament. It says there's one God. The problem is it does not say that there's one Unitarian God. And you can have all the singular pronouns. I don't know how many times you heard singular pronouns. That's not even an argument tonight. I believe in the singular pronouns. All the argument is, well, if he was a Trinitarian God, he would have used plural pronouns. The revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity takes place in the incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit of God. That took place between the Testaments. We have to allow God to be free to reveal himself. What if the people later on after Moses said, we're only going to stick with Moses. We're not going to accept anything that Isaiah says. You see, this is not a meaningful hermeneutical approach whatsoever. 
He says, we should have no problem finding the Son in the Old Testament. Well, again, the specific revelation of the divine persons takes place in the Incarnation and in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God between the Testaments. But I see the Son in the Old Testament, and so did the early church writers called the Apostles. We see him in Psalm 2, kiss the Son. We see him in Psalm 22, the Messianic Psalm. We see in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who's to come. We see him in Isaiah 43, the I Am, that Jesus quotes him himself in John 13, 19. We see him in Genesis 8, 18, the Yahweh who walks on earth and rains fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. We see him in Isaiah chapter 6. He's the one seen, according to John chapter 12, by Isaiah himself. Even in Isaiah 9, 6, we have a child that is born to us, Yalad, the, the Hebrew root there refers to natural birth, but a son is given to us. I see him all over the place, but the specific revelation of that takes place in the incarnation. Now, we said that there is no biblical distinction between being and person, is that what we were told, yet Oneness folks use those categories. In fact, Mr. Perkins, in talking about Jesus, said that he assumed a human mind. Where's that kind of category in the New Testament? Where's that kind of language? If we're going to say, well, you have to use only biblical language, can the oneness person explain the relationship of the divine and human in Jesus without without violating his own standards at that point? We need to be consistent at that point. Now, um, first and third persons, we are told, the first and third persons sent the Son. And I was asked to deal with John 8, 42. This is another wonderful example of where we have to allow the scriptures to speak for themselves. We must harmonize them, not set them in contrast to one another. When Jesus says he was not, he did not come of himself, he, he says, op em out to, follow the use of reflexive pronouns in Johannian corpus, and you will st- discover in John chapter 5, Jesus says he does nothing off he out to, of himself. Here he says he did not come of himself. That does not mean he did not come voluntarily. Yes, he is sent by the Father. He has the Father's authority. He is the one sent by him. No question about that. But how many times does Jesus have to talk about the voluntariness of his coming for it to be found true? We looked at it in Philippians 2. He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. How clear can it be? We have to allow all of Scripture to speak. We don't set Scripture in contrast to Scripture and say that it somehow is contradictory. Now, it's interesting. In a previous debate, Mr. Perkins had many times had said, well, oida means this and gnosko means this. Oida means certain knowledge. Gnosko means partial knowledge. Now he says, well, Vine says that frequently it can mean this. And I'm glad that I've had some positive effect upon Mr. Perkins' knowledge of syntactical categories in the Greek language. Because the fact of the matter is, oida and gnosko have overlapping syntactical categories, semantic meanings, and there are places where oida does not mean full knowledge, and there are places where gnosko does. That's simply the point that I was making. If Mr. Perkins would like to uh, argue that, then I would ask him to show me any of his lexical sources that say what he himself has said in the past, that oida has this meaning, and gnosko has this meaning, and that they are different from one another, and that they are not semantically related. It is said the Old Testament saints, if the Trinity is true, the Old Testament saints did not know who they worshipped. That is not true. God had revealed himself to them up to a certain point. But this again leads us to the exact same problem I noted before. If you limit the New Testament revelation the way that Mr. Perkins is limiting and saying, no, 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 we see Unitarianism in the Old Testament, so that's what the New Testament has to be saying, then you've destroyed all the further revelation that comes out in regards to the very God. 